The eigenfunctions of the rigid rotor uh, we saw could be written as a product of a theta dependent part and a phi dependent part. And we could then uh, write down very explicit expressions. The theta dependent part was dependent upon the associated Legendre polynomials, and the phi dependent part was just something like e to the i m phi. And these things had energy levels that were given by um, h bar squared over 2i times l times l plus 1, where l is equal to 0, 1, 2, 3, and so forth. All right, so the solutions are, are fairly well understood. What I want to do is, is look at these uh, eigenfunctions a little bit more carefully. And in fact, what we'll find is that these eigenfunctions, as we've written them, if we were to normalize them, um, they would be written something like this. And uh, I realize that this looks like a very uh, frightful sort of equation. Um, this first part is just the normalization constant. So I'm going to ask you to really just think of this as a number that is going to cause the uh, wave function to be normalized. And you can plug these values in to calculate that normalization constant no matter what. And then the functional part is just the associated Legendre polynomial for values of L and M, evaluated with an argument of cosine theta, and then e to the i m phi. All right, now with this normalization constant, what that means is that these functions um, are going to be normalized. If I take the square magnitude of this and integrate it over all the values of theta and phi, I should get 1. Now, the one thing I want to do with this formula, though, is point out that, in fact, these functions have themselves their own name, and we call them, we, we use the symbol y to denote them, and l and m are indicated. And these are functions called the spherical harmonics. So as I've indicated, these spherical harmonics now are normalized. So the way I would express that functionally is I would integrate over both phi and theta. Okay, the integral over phi would look like this. The integral over theta would be like this. Now here's a case where we have to use the uh, volume element for theta, so that's sine theta. And then we would have uh, the spherical harmonic, and since uh, it is a real function, well, it's not always a real function, so let's make this the complex conjugate and y l m theta phi, and we've already got the delta. So this integral is the one we're calculating, and we would get 1, as long as this, the spherical harmonic listed here is the same as the one listed here. And if the two values of l here were different, then this would equal 0. They, they would be orthogonal to one another, because the associated Legendre polynomials are orthogonal to one another. All right, so what are some of these spherical harmonics? What do they look like? All right, I'll, I'll write just the first couple down. Uh, they're not difficult functions when at the low end. Okay, the very first one is just a constant. There's no theta or phi dependence in this spherical harmonic. But when we go up to L equals 1, okay, for example, L equals 1 and M equals 0, then I'll have square root of 3 over 4 pi cosine theta as the spherical harmonic. For plus or minus 1, it turns out it's the same value uh, except for the uh, e to the i m phi part. And this would be equal to 3 over 8 pi sine theta. And then the, the complex part would be plus or minus i phi. Okay, the plus or minus is from the plus or minus 1 up here. Okay, lastly, uh, we could have uh, spherical harmonic for 2, 0 which would be the square root of 5 over 16 pi, if you plug it into this formula here. And it's 3 cosine squared theta minus 1. All right, so these are the first four sphere spherical harmonics, or at least the ones for these particular values of L and M. Now, if I were to write down sort of the Schrodinger equation for this rigid rotor Hamiltonian system. Remember that we've got 
h times this function of theta and phi is equal to h times the spherical harmonics because they are the eigenfunctions of the Hamiltonian as we've written it here. And that's equal to whatever energies we have times these spherical harmonics. That's the, just the Schrodinger equation. And then we found that those energy levels were h bar squared over 2i times l times l plus 1 times these spherical harmonics. Okay, now why have I bothered to write all this out in uh, just sort of pedantic detail? Well, I'll point out that uh, what we have here is the eigenvalue equation, which is the Schrodinger equation. So in other words, the fit spherical harmonics are the eigenfunctions of the Hamiltonian. I've been calling it something different, but they are the spherical harmonics. But we also have, interestingly, that the Hamiltonian is just 1 over 2i times the angular momentum squared. So what does that mean? Well, let's suppose that I took 1 over 2i times the angular momentum squared operating on the spherical harmonics. What would I get? Well, this is just the Hamiltonian. Okay, it is simply going to be h bar squared over 2i l times l plus 1 times the spherical harmonics. Okay, I've just written this part back down here. Okay, the 1 over 2i is the same on both of these equations, so I could just multiply through by 2i, and what I would end up getting is a special uh, equation that reminds us that, in fact, these spherical harmonics are indeed eigenfunctions of the angular momentum squared. And their eigenvalue is h bar squared times l times l plus 1. So this result means that any time I have a Hamiltonian or something that depends upon the angular momentum squared, um, that part of the problem is going to have the spherical harmonics as an eigenfunction. All right, and it will have this eigenvalue. So this is very powerful. Whenever I have L squared as part of my Hamiltonian, I'll be able to solve that piece of the Hamiltonian at least, if not the whole Hamiltonian, um, using something related to the spherical harmonics. Now I also want to point out another uh, interesting fact, and that is that the LZ operator, and I'll remind you what that looked like when we wrote it in spherical harmonics, was minus IH bar d d phi. Well, the spherical harmonics are really just a, uh, if I were to take this and now operate it on, say, the LM spherical harmonic, okay, well, this is just a part that depends upon theta, so I'll say function of theta times e to the i m phi. So when I take this LZ and operate it on e to the i m phi, I'm just taking the derivative. So I would end up with minus i h bar times this theta dependent part times i m times e to the i m phi. Okay, well, so this part will come out here with that, and I'll end up with m h bar times the theta dependent part times e to the i m phi, but this is just the spherical harmonic that I started with. So in other words, LZ operating on a spherical harmonic is going to equal MH bar times the spherical harmonic. So the spherical harmonics are also eigenfunctions of the LZ operator. So in other words, both LZ and L squared share the same eigenfunctions in this particular case, which also should tell us that uh, without having to work through the details, we can predict that the commutator between L squared and LZ should be equal to zero because they share the same eigenstates.